looking today at a pretty popular and I think often used uh, passage in an advanced English kind of like AP language classroom. And this is the Florence Kelly uh, speech that she gave to the convention for the National American Women's Suffrage Association. This was in uh, 1905 before women received the right to vote, Philadelphia. Uh, and so you're often probably going to be given this passage to, to talk through in class just to understand how to get down to what the author is doing through the choices made in the text, right? So uh, in one hand, we're going to look at the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts of this passage and, and kind of take out um, some of the maybe rhetorical devices and other things like this. I'm not going to name all the rhetorical devices because, um, you know, part of this is going to be a launching you into thinking through some of these things. So sometimes I'll just pose questions. But as we read this, we also want to kind of step back from the text because not only do we have to see, um, you know, what is it this author is doing uh, within diction choices and within sentence structure, but also within the argument. So there is going to be, uh, you know, a tonal shift. We're going to look for uh, this is, you know, one aspect that the author is going after, and then it shifts to then take a different approach or a different tact or, or use what was said to then jump or make another point or conclusion. So we're going to look for that tonal shift as we go through here as well. And uh, we want to be able to get to, so before the tonal shift, what's the author's purpose? Because that gives us a paragraph to write about. And then after the author's tonal shift, what was the author's purpose? And that gives us a second paragraph to write about. So we're, a lot is going on. And so we're going to go through this obviously a little bit more slowly than one would if you were sitting down to some sort of exam that was timed. Uh, so this will be one of those practices for what you will have to learn to do quickly. All right, so let's jump into this. This was kind of the prompt piece here. Just gave some background information that I already said. She was a United States social worker and a reformer who fought successfully for child labor laws and improved conditions for working women. So a lot of the speech then uh, at the Women's Suffrage Association is going to be about children as laborers and, and the conditions for working women as well. And so one would have to then ask the question, what is her overall purpose to be speaking on this at a women's right to vote conference, right? What is, what is she trying? How, does the, how do those two things connect? So here we go. Uh, I've numbered the paragraphs here because they weren't numbered. Uh, just lines were numbered. Uh, we have in this country 2 million children under the age of 16 years who are earning their bread. They vary in age from 6 and 7 years in the cotton mills of Georgia and 8, 9, and 10 years in the coal breakers of Pennsylvania to 14, 15, and 16 years in more enlightened states. So this is kind of like when you maybe call that the exposition, kind of laying out the situation. And there's some things that are set out right, and there's obviously some subtext as well. So one of those things, right, um, we see specifically there are some states that are named. So you have Georgia, and tied into Georgia, right, you have specifically six and seven years. And one would assume that six and seven-year-olds working in cotton mills would be somewhat grievous to people that that would seem like how, why are six and seven year olds working in, in a cotton mill and then pennsylvania is also called out here and that is given like okay eight nine and eight and nine uh seven sorry yeah eight nine and ten year olds are are working uh in coal breakers so it sounds maybe a little even more harsh than the other in georgia but why, what's the purpose like of, of calling out these particular states, right? What would be behind that? What is she trying to do? And then she uses this word here, uh, in more enlightened states. So, you know, if there's 14, 15, 16 year olds, maybe, you know, even in, in modern culture, 16 year olds are, are working. Uh, I started working when I was 15. And so maybe people would not think that. So like, that's a little more uh, acceptable perhaps, and that's perhaps why she used the word enlightened. But still, obviously, if you have, you know, when they say enlightened, does she mean that completely seriously? Because wouldn't even 14, 15, and 16 year olds need some sort of uh, protection or, or help if they're being exposed to harsh working conditions, right? But this is perhaps closer uh, in terms of uh, a working age. So we kind of here have a laying out of the, the issue, how common it is. 
Uh, so we see uh, in these southern states and, and more northern states and all around we have these children that are having to work. Second paragraph, no other portion of the wage earning increase class increased so rapidly from decade to decade as the young girls from 14 to 20 years. So we're here having a focus, right? Remember where she's speaking, young girls from 14 to 20, and we have increased so rapidly. So here she's pointing out, right? Our gender is the biggest growing percentage or group that, that you're seeing here. Boys increase in the ranks of the breadwinners. So yes, there's more boys, but no contingent so doubles from census period to census period, percent and count of heads, as does the contingent of girls between 12 and 20 years of age. So they are in commerce, in offices, and in manufacturing. So the question then, right, is what is she, what case is she building here uh, to the audience she's speaking to? And so that's kind of an important question here, right? We see growing, growing numbers of women entering into these aspects of commerce and offices and in manufacturing, right? So of course, when we see that, when we, when we talk about the circumstances that she's, she's speaking in, the growing numbers of women that are actually investing in the maybe infrastructure or economics of society, what does that have to do or how does that tie in to them ha should, ha should be having the right to vote? Do you see that connection? Okay. So women are growing percentage of workforce. So that's kind of an important aspect of this, right? Kind of justifies why she's tying these two things together, perhaps. Moving on, paragraph three. Tonight, while we sleep, several thousand little girls will be working in textile mills all the night through in the deafening noise of the spindles and the looms spinning and weaving cotton and wool, silks and ribbons for us to buy. So a couple things we want to talk through here, right? Uh, there's There's... Two times in this paragraph, she's speaking to the audience. Number one, we're sleeping, and then they're doing this for us to buy, right? So we want to see how that that can that ties the paragraph together, and we want to also think about sleep a little bit. Um, you know, what are some aspects of being asleep? Obviously, you're resting. So while adults, including the women there, are resting at night, all night long, children are are working. Uh, also, an, is an issue about being asleep, right, is, is being unaware. And so perhaps part of this is to draw a connection to the audience because here it is, is like they're, they're, they're making this cotton and wool, silks and ribbons for us to buy, right? The product being produced is for us. And so in a way that's kind of like we are connected to this, we are part of the cause, we don't want to necessarily say she's trying to lay a guilt trip on them, right? Because uh, if you say Florence Kelly's laying a guilt trip, when when you use that term, that, that has a connotation meaning that she's uh, a bad guy here. Someone trying to put a guilt trip on you, uh, you resent that. So is she trying to make people resent her as the speaker? Uh, or is she trying to draw attention to the fact that the demand for these products in part is caused by even us in this audience as women? And so, therefore, if we're part of the, the perhaps potential problem or the problem here, if we're part of the problem here, what does that mean for us? Okay. And so let's talk about some of the imagery here within this, right? If you look at this, right, several thousand, we use a word. Why would she choose a word like little? Okay. There's an, a reason behind that choice. They're, okay. They're working. There's deafening noise. And then you have this idea of spinning and weaving cotton and wool. So you have words like deafening, spinning and weaving, and you get this idea of kind of a chaotic, loud, maybe even dangerous atmosphere that these children, little girls are in, and the audience is asleep in their beds, warm, comfy, cozy. So do you see how powerful this paragraph can be um, when, we, when we start stepping back and talking about purpose? So moving on, paragraph four. In Alabama, the law provides that a child under 16 years of age shall not work in a cotton mill at night longer than eight hours, and Alabama does better in this respect than any other southern state. North and South Carolina and Georgia place no restriction upon the work of children at night, and 
While we sleep, little white girls will be working tonight in the mills of the, in those states, working 11 hours at night. So let's talk uh, a little bit about this paragraph here. Uh, a couple things, right? We do have a calling out again. We have like Alabama, North and South Carolina, Georgia, and there's they, they can work at night. So in other words, these states are not doing what they need to do to regulate. So we have a lack of regulation by states that allow this. So in other words, right, um, these companies, unless they're told otherwise, are going to uh, allow this to happen. And if the, the families let the kids work and they, they need the money or whatever, it's, it's going to happen. Um, but now, obviously, uh, this is still not good. We have in, in Alabama, right, this idea of in a, Alabama, they can't work more than eight hours all night long. Again, you go back to where she said, while, while we sleep, and uh, that's potentially an issue. One of the things I do want to briefly mention here is this idea of, of uh, a couple things. One, uh, there's this concept called presentism, right, where when we, uh, in our current culture, look back at something that's said in the past, we can't completely put our perspective or our values or our moral outrage on everything that happened in the past, right? So I would look at this and I would be like, this is evil to have children working at all, especially young children at that age. And clearly she feels strongly that they shouldn't be as well. But the reality of that situation was that that was what was happening and that they knew it was happening. And in fact, there were some states with restrictions upon it. You can't work more than eight hours at night uh, as, as a younger uh, child. But my moral outrage in response to this article does not answer the prompt. So a prompt might ask something like this one, right, that says, analyze the rhetorical strategies Kelly uses to convey her message about child labor and support that with references to the text. If I go off on a tangent about how wrong this was to let children work uh, because it's just not right, I'm off the prompt. And so that's not going to have uh, give me any success in my essay. And so we have a few things like that, right? When, when she says here, right, why does she say specifically uh, little white girls? Uh, why not any girl? So one of, that's another thing where, yeah, we may take issue with that, but what, what, who was her audience? Um, was her audience, uh, there, was there any people of color in her audience at all? We don't know that necessarily, um, but perhaps there were not. I don't know. But again, if I start talking about race issues uh, in this passage for that prompt, does that serve the purpose of answering the prompt? So I may take personal issue with that because uh, I don't think uh, girls of any shade of skin should be working all night in a factory. But that's really not what it is, this is about or th that's going on here. So those are, those are the kinds of things like when we start feeling ourselves respond, we have to stay on point to what our actual task is and what we're supposed to be doing. They're working 11 hours at night. So... This is a reinforcement of how common the problem is. Reinforcement of problem here. There's really not regulation going on. And so there's something implied here about who is supposed to do something about this, right? So who is it that is supposed to or who can do something about this? And then how does that tie in to women's suffrage and the women's right to vote? So again, I'm pose, posing some questions here. I'm not giving answers, but I am trying to lead you to a point where you start thinking through, uh, because we do have to get to the purpose here. In Georgia, there is no restriction whatever, exclamation point. A girl of six or seven years, just tall enough to reach the bobbins, may work 11 hours by day or by night, and they will do so tonight while we sleep. Do you see the repetition there? She keeps bringing that back. They will do so tonight while we sleep. So this is almost, you know, there's some parallels here in this paragraph as we look at this. There's some parallels. So they are, uh, they're working 11 hours while we sleep. So we, that, we see that while we sleep repeated, and that's kind of important uh, as we move forward into talking about this, uh, that idea that 
uh, we're allowing this to happen. Because when you're sleeping, you're not active. You're not being proactive. You're being actually pa very passive. You're laying there completely unaware and clueless. Uh, but then you have another, you know, other idea of re repetition here. Just tall enough to reach the bobbins. So that's a kind of a, a imagery uh, being used there. A girl of six or seven years, uh, we can we can see in our mind that she has no business working with things she can barely reach. She's just tall enough to reach it. So how can she really be equipped or able to deal or work in that condition well? She's too little. She's too young. Nor is it only in the South that these things occur. Alabama does better than New Jersey. Okay, so not a limited problem here. Not a limited problem. For Alabama, limits the children's work at night to eight hours, while New Jersey permits it all night long. Last year, New Jersey took a long backward step. A good law was repealed, which had required women and children to stop work at six in the evening and noon on Friday. Now, therefore, in New Jersey, boys and girls after their 14th birthday enjoy the pitiful privilege of working all night long. And so we have a specific example, right? This is her uh, using a specific example of a widespread issue, right? So that's a, she's calling out New Jersey there. But again, she's saying, you know, the, the North isn't any better than the South. It's, this is not a North-South issue. And then you have this interesting sentence here. First of all, alliteration, right? Pitiful privilege. Uh, and then that's not used intentionally. Because the word pitiful, we know, is, is negative, worthy of pity. And then privilege as something that you're getting to do, that you desire to do. And then she uses the word enjoy. So there's a juxtaposition here, right, of enjoy and privilege. But then she uses the juxtaposition of the word here, pitiful, to let us know she, to let us know she means exactly the opposite of that. So she's almost using a what we'd say is a sarcastic or derisive tone as she uh, kind of says this is ridiculous. The implication here is this is horrific. Uh, another example here in Pennsylvania until last May it was lawful for children 13 years of age to work 12 hours at night. A little girl on her 13th birthday could start away from her home at half past five in the afternoon carrying her pail of midnight luncheon as happier people carry their midday luncheon and can work in the mill from six at night until six in the morning without violating any law of the Commonwealth. And so here she has a really powerful image, right? So this is a hypothetical, because it says she could, hypothetical situation, but was probably very close to the truth. And this is specifically, you know, naming Pennsylvania as a place, but it could be anywhere, right? It could be uh, New Jersey, right? And so here you have this uh, imagery here that she is on her 13th birthday, young 13. Uh, she's leaving home at 5.30 in the afternoon when other people are coming home um, and having to take a, a midnight lunch with her. So this is kind of a harsh image, a harsh picture of a real reality. Okay, And this is, in other words, and then she says, this is not against the law. So the implication there is, this should be against the law because she says she, this happens without violating any law. Next one, uh, paragraph eight. If the mothers and the teachers in Georgia could vote, would the Georgia legislature have refused at every session for the last three years to stop the work in the mills of children under 12 years of age? Okay, what do we, we not, that's a question. We, we know what kind of uh, you know, response, if, if there's a question that's asked, with uh, an implied response. We know what that is, right? Hypothetical question. Uh, and clearly, the answer would be no. And so the solution to this problem then is what? Okay? So in here is a part of an implied solution to the problem. This is the implied solution. Would the New Jersey legislature have passed that shameful repeal bill enabling girls of 14 years to work all night if... The mothers in New Jersey were enfranchised. That's a word you should know. Enfranchised means you have the right to vote. You've been, you've given, been given the right to vote. That's one meaning of enfranchised. Um, it also means freed from slavery. But in this case, it's being used for, for being given the right to vote. Okay, so there, here's again 
um, a hypothetical question again, and we already know what her answer would be. <clears throat> so here she's asking uh, another hypothetical question again. Until the mothers in the great industrial states are enfranchised, we shall none of us be able to free our consciences from participation in this great evil. So what am I hoping you see here? Until the mothers in the great industrial states are enfranchised, we shall none of us be able to free our consciences from participation in this great evil. And so here she ties in uh, her passion, which we saw in the actual kind of prompt that was given out, her passion of working conditions for children and women into the audience to whom she's speaking. But there also is the tie-in to what she said earlier, right? And when she said earlier that, you know, we are sleeping and they're creating these things for us to buy, they're working without restriction while we sleep. And so here is what she's trying to say through that, right? Participation in this great evil. Currently, even though we don't have the right to vote, by just living, buying things um, in this society, we are participating. And so in that sense, uh, what, what is supposed to then be the impact upon the audience in the desire to get the right to vote? Okay, that's the question there. Okay, so that's the question, right? Is the desired impact on audience. So the other thing to see here, right, is all of this kind of now is tied together. So when we talk about a tonal shift, uh, so far, this all ties together. Like, these are the laws in the states, or lack of laws in the states, which allow this to happen. So all of these children are working for to create the stuff that we, as a culture, are buying, which reinforces uh, the, the labor practices that are, are taking place, and without the right for women to vote, is there going to be a change in this? Would these states, if we could vote, would these states have been able to ignore the necessary changes to make working conditions better for children? So these are the questions here, right? No one in this room tonight can feel free from such participation. So we are guilty, I guess, by association. So guilty... By association, we are complicit, we are a part of this, and so therefore we have to be working to change that, right? The children make our shoes in the shoe factories, they knit our stockings, our knitted underwear in the knitting factories, they spin and weave our cotton. Do you see how this repetition, look at this repetition, right? They, where is it at? Our shoes, our stockings, our knitted underwear, our cotton underwear, right? For our, they, they braid straws for our hats. They spin and weave the silk and velvet uh, wherewith we trim our hats. They stamp buckles and metal ornaments of all kinds, as well as pins and hat pins. Under the sweating system, tiny children make artificial flowers and neckwear for us to, us to buy. They carry bundles of garments from the factories to the tenements, little beasts of burden, robbed of school life so that they may work for us. So there is no doubt uh, that she leaves that we all per are participating just by allowing this to continue. So you kind of start to see her purpose in this first part. And I know you're like, but wait, shouldn't we have a rhetoric, uh, a tonal shift already? Look how much of this we've talked about already. There's no way. Uh, no one says that this has to be 50-50 division. Like, oh, here's a nice, clean uh, tonal shift here. There's no rule like that. So we really haven't yet seen a tonal shift because what she's saying in paragraph 9 here is also what she said in paragraph 3, is it not? So the other thing right here is we want, let's look at some of the word choices here that she made. She says they are uh, little beasts of burden. We're treating them, you know, what's a beast of burden? It's like a donkey or a horse where, uh, or an ox that you're just using this animal to, to do things for you. You have words like robbed. So there's all of these sweating system, tiny children. These are all intentional choices, right? What is the, uh, what is the point here? What is she trying to emphasize uh, in terms of how the culture is treating these children? Not only children, right? Tiny children. 
So there's a lot of connotation in these words. There's a lot of um, emotional language here, pathos or, or pathos, depending on if you want to say it right or not. Shameful, repeal, Bill. So there's a lot of uh, emotional, emotion-heavy wording in this. Next part. Uh, we do not wish this. We prefer to have our work done by men and women. But we are almost powerless. Not wholly powerless, however, are citizens who enjoy the right of petition. Okay, so you see the chain. Does she still condemning them entirely at this point, right? No. What is it that we now instead of she goes to talk, she's talking to the crowd here. You know, now she's saying, we do not wish this. In other words, I've laid out this case. Is this what we really want? We actually prefer men and women. So in a way, this is a little bit of a relief. We want the right thing. We don't want children to do this. We want men and women to do this. But then here's this but here. But we are almost powerless. And what's the implication here, right? It's that we don't have the right to vote, but we enjoy the right of petition. We can at least ask, 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 ask here, right? So right now we don't have that and that's what we're fighting for so that we can make a change. But what about in the meantime? What about in the meantime? And so are you seeing what I'm trying to point out is happening here? What do we think then this is? I know that's messy, but what do we think that might be? Hmm. And so above this line, what would be the author's purpose here when she tries to convey a message about child labor? What is she doing through this first part? And then we can move into this other part here. For myself, I shall use this power in every possible way until the right to the ballot is granted, and then I can, shall continue to use both. Okay, in other words, I will not remain silent, right? I will petition, I will not remain silent. Because sometimes when you when you feel like you have no power or you're powerless, like she had, she had said here, what might you do? What might be a response? However, is that her response? What is it, in fact, that she says she's going to be doing here? What can we do to free our consciences? There is one line of action by which we can do much. Okay, so what is she doing right here, right? The idea, if she's, she's giving them something, so here's, we would call, I would call that, right, the call to action. Now that I've given you the problem or the situation and what we're working for, but we don't have it yet, what can we do? What's the call to action? What do I, as the speaker, desire you, the audience, to take from this and move forward and do? We can enlist the working men on behalf of our enfranchisement, just in proportion as we strive with them to free the children. Okay, so just as we're trying to get the right to vote, we can do the same kind of petitioning and pleading and fighting for children at the same time, right? Do you see the marriage here of the two? So there's a marriage of causes here. Why might she want that marriage? What is she about? What is her passion? No labor organization in this country ever fails to respond to an appeal for help in the freeing of children. In other words, right, this is a righteous cause. We cannot go wrong by fighting for children. Uh, for the sake of the children, for the republic in which these children will vote after we are dead, and for the sake of our cause, we should enlist the working men voters with us in this task of freeing the children from toil. Since we don't yet have the vote, what are we to do? And this is what she's telling us. You, you ally. It's, a, it's a, an idea of being allied with or connecting with or partnering with those that actually have the vote for now until we get the vote. And so there is a call to action here. Uh, and you might think, well, they should have the right to vote. They shouldn't have to uh, go to, to, to the men uh, that do vote to, to do something about it. They should have, yeah, that's what they're fighting for, right? But do they have it? What's the reality of the situation? So in, in, in this case, right, Florence Kelly, is she not being a pragmatist or a realist here uh, with the present situation? I don't have this yet, which is why we're here, 
But in the meantime, what is it that we can do? And so when you start asking questions like that, I'm not going to get sidetracked uh, by the way I think, well, women should be having the right to vote at this point. Okay, but is it the, that, that's not the, the world we live in. The world that she lives in is she does not. And so what is it then that she's trying to accomplish in the meantime? And so when we talk about after the tonal shift, the author's purpose and uh, what she's trying to encourage or you know build up her audience to do, these are like the steps that she says uh, until. And so we have the dream, but until the dream is realized, this is, this is the direction we must take because there's a, a, a big cause here. We're not just getting the right to vote for ourselves. It's, it's bigger than that, right? So that's kind of the important question at the end of this. So hopefully that was helpful when we talked about how to uh, read through this prompt, how to understand this passage, but also how to step back and, and look at the tonal shift before and after. What's the big picture here? and be able to talk about the rhetorical choices or strategies that the author is making as she gives this speech. All right, so hopefully that was helpful. Really appreciate you watching this video. It would be amazing. You're a fabulous person if you could subscribe to the channel. Here's a bunch of other videos that are writing workshops to help you deal with all kinds of facets of writing and growth as a writer. Uh, and then a couple other playlists that you might just find amusing or interesting or even helpful. Thank you so much. Until next time.